grace to you and peace from God, our creator, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Behold, the Judas goat. He looks harmless, doesn't he? But he would not be called the Judas goat if there weren't nefarious things going on. A Judas goat is actually a goat that has been trained to herd other animals, usually sheep or cattle. And it's all well and good unless you are the Judas goat of a stockyard. And then you are almost always leading sheep and cattle to the slaughterhouse while you get to escape scot-free. And these poor Judas goats, well, they don't even really know what they're doing, but they're leading others astray. They've gained trust, and now they're abusing it. You know, Judas wasn't always a name synonymous with betrayal. It was actually a really popular name before Judas ruined it. Actually, Jesus had several Judas disciples, which is why in our reading today, we have to look and see that it was Judas, not Iscariot, asking the question of Jesus. A caveat had to be put in there. It's the only caveat in the Bible. Judas, not Iscariot. Just so you know that there are other Judases who aren't so bad. And that's when Judas, not Iscariot, asked a question. And that question's off the page. So let me read for you what Judas, not Iscariot, asked Jesus. Judas, not Iscariot, asked the Lord, How is it that you will reveal yourself to us and not to the world? Judas, not Iscariot, wanted to know what was going to happen when Jesus left. Because he's been talking about leaving a lot these last few chapters in John. In the short amount of time between Jesus' resurrection and the writing of John's gospel, the name Judas had become so synonymous with betrayal that this poor Judas can't even ask a simple question without having to be designated as not Iscariot. But it is also a rhetorical device that John uses in his gospel by making sure we know that there is more than one Judas. He's setting a dichotomy between Judas not Iscariot and Judas Iscariot. Judas, not Iscariot, is asking a very faithful question about what will happen and how they are to know. How do they stay connected to Jesus? While Judas Iscariot is in the background on this very night plotting, because this is the last night Jesus has with them. And it seems that the difference between these two men all comes down to words. Listen to what Jesus says is the most crucial thing to center one's life around in his absence. Recall from the reading, Jesus said, Those who love me will keep my word, and my Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Jesus knows that on this last night with his disciples, this last night among humanity in the flesh, he has to tell them something very critical. And it seems what he is saying that the only thing that we cannot afford to lose in this life are his words. It is not his physical presence. It is not a place or a thing. It's the words he has spoken and given to us that we must hang on to at all costs. His words about forgiveness and peace. Words about the meal we are to share. Words about baptism and sin. Words about the cross he bears for us. Words he teaches us to pray. It is only when we are surrounded by these words, Jesus says, that God makes his home among us. That's pretty crucial, don't you think? That's what Jesus tells Judas, not Iscariot. And that is a problem for Judas, actual Iscariot. He has been overtaken by the wrong words. The world, the world rather, has whispered to him, we are going to make you rich. It's promised him worldly peace, the sort attained by power and violence. 
And Judas Iscariot has let those words author his actions. His betrayal is eminent along with his demise. The words he's following we all know will estrange him from Jesus, from the promise of the Holy Spirit, and from eternal life with God the Father. Now, we might be tempted to look at this dichotomy that John sets up in his gospel between Judas not Iscariot and Judas Iscariot as an either-or situation and then decide which one are we. It's especially easy for us to point to people in our lives who are clearly listening to the wrong words, like Judas Iscariot. It's really easy for us to look at people who are obviously addicted to alcohol or drugs, or they're, they're letting bad decision-making take over their lives. They're obviously on the wrong track. They're obviously listening to the words of the world. Harder for us is to be honest about our own lives. Honest about the sometimes painful reality that both Judas not Iscariot and Judas Iscariot are operant in our lives, fighting an ongoing battle within us. And too many times we've let Judas Iscariot win and we have followed false world, words along with him. Now for me lately, my Judas Iscariot moments have come when I find myself just drenched in the words of cynicism and despair. I find myself so discouraged about the world we're living in right now that I consider not caring about what happens to it. And worse than that, I confess to you that I consider letting go of the ministries that help push back against the darkness are at least putting as much energy into them as I do. I think of it all the time of like, I, you know, let's just go out and have some fun while we still have the freedom to do it. Why put all this energy in trying to control this chaos? And it's texts like this that convict those feelings I have and make me wonder what Jesus can actually do with a heart that's been so consumed by the wrong words. Well, I got another picture for you, of course. Look at this poor little guy. He is actually on the road to recovery in this picture. This is a bummer lamb, a bummer lamb, all right? And bummer lambs are ones that have been rejected by their mothers. And the mother refuses to nurse them or even acknowledge them. But that does not stop this little sheep from trying to engage the mother from trying to pursue this rejected word, right? But that pursuit is actually what starts to bum this little lamb out, and it hurts its neck. The energy it takes to follow around a mother not paying attention actually starts to break his little neck. I know, this is the saddest thing. I'm sorry. Um, it gets better. Um, but... As his neck muscles atrophy, if a shepherd is really paying attention, you can put this poor picture down, okay. <laughs> if a shepherd is really paying attention and sees that this little lamb's neck is starting to atrophy, a good shepherd will take the little lamb in and will nurse him with a bottle and cuddle it and talk to it and save it. And eventually a bummer lamb can be healed and its neck recovered. But here's the best part. A bummer lamb actually goes back to live with the flock. But from that moment on, it will always, until its dying breath, recognize the voice of that shepherd, of the words that paid attention to him, that saved him. I think in this moment, Jesus isn't speaking just to Judas, not Iscariot, to the one getting it right. He is speaking to the battle between the Judases that rage within us. He's saying to us who are pursuing words that will leave us rejected in the end, do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not let them be afraid. Rather, listen to me. Let me author your life 
Remember my words. Let me feed you. Let me cradle you. Let me speak to you. Return to me. Now, what does that look like? To let Jesus author our lives in the midst of such chaos. Well, Desmond Doss. Desmond Doss listened on the radio with horror, along with every other American, as the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. And he knew that he had to do something to help his country. But he was, first and foremost, a follower of Jesus, specifically a Seventh-day Adventist. And if you know anything about Seventh-day Adventists, they do not believe in taking life or carrying a weapon. They are completely nonviolent. Still, he was determined. And so he enlisted in the army. And Desmond was assigned to the infantry as a medic. But Doss was not surrounded by good words, people who appreciated his nonviolent stance. In fact, he was a pariah in his unit. And the soldier saw his persistent belief that he could not take life nor carry a weapon as a liability. One soldier went as far as to say to Desmond, Doss, as soon as we get into combat, I'm going to make sure you don't come back alive. And in 1945, his unit was sent to Okinawa, and Doss went into every battle. But instead of carrying a weapon, he carried a medical stretcher everywhere he went, treating the injured. Still a pariah. This scrawny, skinny little kid who would not fight carried a stretcher and was scorned. But then, late April, his unit was sent to fight along a treacherous 400-foot jagged cliff in Okinawa, nicknamed by the men Hacksaw Ridge, because that's what it did to you when you climbed up it. And when they got to the top, waiting for them, hidden in the caves, were thousands, thousands of armed Japanese soldiers. And so Doss's unit was repelled back, but not before it would strand over a hundred wounded or killed men at the top of Hacksaw Ridge. With nothing but that stretcher and under unimaginable fire, Doss retrieved over 75 men, one by one by one by one, up and down the face of Hacksaw Ridge with nothing but a stretcher. He received the Medal of Honor from President Truman. We've decided that this looks like Jim Campbell. (laughs) Well done, Jim. He was the only conscientious objector to ever receive the Medal of Honor. And Doss said on that day, I wanted to serve God and my country, but it had to be in that order. We can't all be conscientious objectors. And Doss was surrounded by so many other words that should have compelled him not to be a conscientious objector. But it was Jesus who authored his life in those moments. Now, I love this story. And if you are keeping time on this sermon, you know this is about where I end. But seeing as how I took away your 8 o'clock service, I'm going to go ahead and lengthen the sermon of this 8 o'clock service so you can be here as long as possible to enjoy it. I love this story. I love this story. I've been waiting a long time to use it. It is a perfect example of what a life centered on Jesus' words can look like. And we can use it to find hope and meaning in ours. But it is also, this week, really discouraging too. Especially right now, because no one looks like that anymore. No one acts like that anymore. No one seems to love God that way anymore, and no one seems to love our country or democracy that way anymore. And the God and country that people do seem to love, I can't hardly recognize. That's how I feel. That's how I feel sometimes about the way things are. But the good news is that it is not about how I feel. It is not about how I feel. It is about where Jesus promises to make his home. And Jesus has promised to make his home where his word is kept. And his word is kept here. I know it. And you want to know how I know? 
on this past Tuesday at our council meeting, where our church leaders made the final decision to change our worship times here at Faith. We had to grapple with the fact that it is a big organizational decision. It is big. And it is going to come with challenges and worries. And so we did worry and fret about this decision a little bit. But you know what we actually spent as much time worrying about in that meeting, as far as I can remember? Community meals. Our Monday night free community meals. We were concerned and spent just as much time talking about the concerns that we are not feeding enough people. We're wondering how we can get the word out there more. How do we... How do we get it specifically to those people who need to eat? Because we know that there are people out there pinched by their finances and that they would benefit from this free meal. And so we talked and we fretted just as much, if not more, about that decision. And that is how I know that God has made his home here among us still. That is how I know Jesus is the author of our lives because we are still worrying about feeding people. And whenever that battle inside you starts going the cynical way of Judas' actual Iscariot, bring your hearts and your minds and your feet and your hands to faith and to this table and let Jesus fill you with words of life and promise that will give you hope even in the darkest, most dismal situations. Words. We dwell among them here and they dwell in us. Thanks be to God. For Jesus' words. Amen.